Thanks to CuriosityStream and Nebula for sponsoring this video. Stick around to the end to get more than 40% off. Warhammer is a game that needs at least two people to play, and this year that's been a bit difficult. Covid has put a complete dampener on my tabletop gaming activities this year, and yes, you can do stuff through Tabletop Simulator, but it's not the same as playing with real plastic crack. While artificial intelligence may be feared in the grim darkness of the far future, fortunately, today, not so much. And using a little bit of programming knowledge, you can crudely approximate an AI. So I used machine learning techniques to teach my computer how to play Warhammer 40,000. Well, not full fat 40k, that's a bit complicated. Instead, I taught my computer how to play Kill Team. Kill Team is the small-scale skirmish version of Games Workshop's Warhammer 40,000. So this is a tabletop game played with miniatures and dice. A game of Kill Team consists of two or more, though I'm definitely limiting it to two, two or more teams of models from the same faction competing to achieve their objectives. So a game, for example, might consist of these Hawaiian Orcs versus these Space Marines. Each model on each of the teams can then do a variety of actions in a specific order as dictated by the rules. A model can move as many inches as its move characteristic allows, which was six inches, for example, for Space Marines, whereas Hormigaunts over here from High Fleet Nostromo, they're a bit faster, so they can move eight inches. After Moving, a model then has the ability to shoot whatever weapons it has. So a model armed with, for example, a heavy bolter, which is a heavy anti-personnel weapon, gets a very high chance of taking out an enemy, whilst a model only armed with a pistol has a relatively slim chance. The chance, of course, is where the dice come in. So a model will roll a dice to see if it hits their enemy, it will then roll another dice if they do hit to see if they wound, and then the model that has been hit gets to roll a dice to see if their armour protects them from that wound. All of these rolls are informed by the characteristics of the models. So a Space Marine has a very high armor save, whilst a Orc is basically wearing a t-shirt, but is quite tough, so it can still shrug wounds on a six. All of this is to say that a game of Kill Team is basically nothing more than a very complicated algorithm, a series of instructions that you execute one after the other with some randomness injected by the dice. So in theory, it would be possible to codify the rules of Kill Team in computer code such that a computer could read it. The first step then in creating my machine opponent was to convert the rules of Kill Team into a form that the computer can read and understand. So I chose to do that in Python code. Here in rulebook.py, uh, we have the rules of Kill Team just put into Python code form. The largest part of this file is the sequence of events that take place in a battle. So you roll two dice each to see, see who goes first, whoever rolls highest goes first, and then the first team gets to do all their movement, the second team gets to do all their movement, and then you go through the shooting phase, the assault phase and then morale at the end of the turn. To accomplish this, the first thing I had to do was to create a virtual battlefield that the battles could take place on. So this class here, Battlefield, is a grid, as well as lots of other information, it, it basically contains a grid that tells us where each model is, and if at a particular point in the battlefield there is a model of one team, the other team, nothing, or if there's terrain, which is going to block line of sight. So what I've done is discretized the space, I've turned it from a continuous thing, because obviously you don't just move in one inch blocks on the battlefield battlefield, but to allow the computer to wrap its head around it, I had to discretize it, and this was the easiest way to do that. I should hold my hands up as well and say that I have made some simplifications. It's not full kill team, because there are several things which were just too complicated to put in. So stratagems, for example, there are no specialists, so no heavies, no leaders, no uh, demolitions people, just because I could have put them in, but I wanted to get this video done before Christmas and sleep before then. And thirdly, the mission that's being fought in this imaginary battlefield is the simplest one possible. You're just trying to kill every other model on the other team, so there's no holding of objectives. Again, I could have put that in, but it was just extra complexity, and I really needed to get this video done. The most crucial part of this whole procedure was identifying where decisions are made. So where, as a human, are you actually uh, exercising agency rather than just going with what the dice tell you to do. So one obvious example of that is where a model moves. So a model can choose to charge a model if it's in range, or it could just choose to move normally, which it would allow it to shoot later in the turn. So as a human, you need to determine where your model is going to go based on a bunch of information, like you know, what other models are around, uh, what weapon do you have, are you a model that is, is good in close combat or bet is better at shooting? All of this determines whether you're gonna stay still and shoot, move in behind cover, or run towards the enemy. So whether or not a model is going to 
to make a normal move is one decision. Whether or not you're going to charge with a model is a separate decision, because they're two different kinds of movement. And then lastly, uh, who you're going to shoot with a model out of all the possible targets you have is another decision. The computer makes a decision at each one of these points based on a model, which is where the machine learning comes into it. So basically, it takes in a bunch of inputs. So here, for example, in the shooting model, uh, it takes in the inputs of how far is the model from its target, what is the model's ballistic skill, what is its uh, weapon's range, how many attacks does it have, so in other words, how good is it in close combat, all of this kind of stuff. That then gets fed into a model which returns a probability. And that probability is how likely is it the model is going to take that action. So what it does is consider all possible actions that it could take, every place it could move to, every model it could shoot, for example, and it ranks them from the most likely to the least likely. Starting from the most likely outcome, the computer then generates a random number between 0 and 1. And basically, if that number is less than the probability that the action is taken, the model takes that action. So if the model has a probability of 0.9, of firing at a given uh, enemy model, there's a 90% chance that it will do so. So when it generates a random number like 0.25, that means that it will decide to take that action. The model then goes through all of the possible outcomes until it hits something that actually does take place. The random number generator says that, oh, that is the action that we're going to take. Or it reaches the end of the list, in which case it doesn't do anything. It doesn't move or it doesn't shoot. The question then becomes, what is this model, this shoot model in this particular example, how does it take those inputs and arrive at a probability? The answer to that is basically just a bunch of maths, it's a bunch of linear algebra to be precise. So this file contains the algorithms that are used and all they are is basically a bunch of matrices and vectors that you take in the inputs, you multiply by a matrix, add a vector to it and you repeat that uh, twice because this is effectively a multi-layer perceptron model. So the probability of an action being taken associated with a given input vector is then purely determined by the values in these matrices, in control rods and in bias. And those values are effectively how the model makes its decisions. That's its decision-making process encoded into just a couple of arrays. All of this then gets brought together in this master Python file. So this takes information from the rulebook uh, about how battles are fought, it takes information from the machine learning algorithms file about how these models work, and it simulates a bunch of battles. In fact, if I run this right now, it will simulate one. You'll notice that I added names to keep track of individual models. That was useful for debugging, but I also find it kind of funny. Ditto for the sound effects. Now, the decision making you're seeing here by these models is basically random. And that's because those matrices and vectors in the machine learning algorithms, they're initialized, their, their first starting values are just random numbers between 0 and 1. And so the probability of a given action being taken by a model here is pretty much just a random outcome. So we need to train this model in order to learn how to play. It knows the rules, but doesn't know how to play well. But I'm not going to teach it how to do that. I'm going to let it teach itself. Specifically, I'm going to use a technique known as reinforcement learning and what's called a genetic algorithm. But what do those terms mean? So reinforcement learning is where you develop uh, essentially reward based model. Um, so you have a model that's looking to find a what's usually called a policy that optimizes for the greatest reward. So most video game machine learning algorithms, uh, models that have been developed to win games like chess uh, are reinforcement learning style models. Genetic algorithms basically trying to model natural selection. Um, so you breed a set of models um, and you try them out and then you take the ones that do well and essentially use those to breed new models based on the parameters that already work well. You usually add some sort of permutation to that model um, <clears throat> in order to help you explore the parameter space a little bit more, maybe hit on something that what is currently best doesn't capture, um, and then keep iterating through that until you find a model that you have determined is the best. This is Jordan Harrod, a PhD student in machine learning at MIT. She has a fantastic YouTube channel all about machine learning and artificial intelligence, which you should absolutely check out. It's got an introduction to machine learning, as well as featuring some interesting experiments. She agreed to help me on this project, giving some advice on how to make the model as effective as possible. For people who are watching this, my extent of 
knowledge on this game is like watching a few of Simon's videos. So not a ton, um, <laughs> but <laughs> so there may be ways to like initialize your weights so that like you are aware of that would help you converge to a solution faster. Um, okay, yeah. But yeah, when it comes to, I, I think that there's a difference between like coding for scale and coding for fun. And when it comes to coding for fun, you don't need to use fancy models. You can just brute force it. There's some amount of utility in developing systems where you know exactly what each part is doing. Hmm. Um, in the sense that, kind of circling back to what I mentioned earlier, in the sense of like, making sure that the problem that you're trying to solve is actually the problem that you're solving. Like, I can look at this and be like, yes, you are developing a model that like, scores high at this game. And like, I know that and you know that. Whereas other types of models, um, because things are a bit more abstracted, it can, you have to be a lot more deliberate about how you set things. Okay, so that's interesting. So I think maybe the thing I need to do going into this is, but up until now, the inputs have been slightly haphazard but i think actually if i know what the inputs are and i have an intuition for for example like the algorithm that determines if a model is going to move to a location there should be like a negative feedback between the number of enemy models that can see you in that location and the probability that you will move there you know like if i know you were... basically nothing about this game but sure okay but... <laughs> that sounds correct okay good as long as it sounds correct that's fine <laughs> But good. Okay, so I, uh, basically, I need to go away and think about what the input vector is and how I anticipate the model should react to that. And that gives the genetic algorithm kind of like a head start on finding yeah. the best possible approach. Yeah, in general, it helps to initialize models if you have any sort of intuition about like how the model should converge. Um, and like part of that is also making sure that like what you think the model should do is actually what the model should be doing because there may be other things that you're not aware of. But um, it just in terms of like optimization efficiency, like instead of having to, you know, run a thousand loops, maybe you only have to run a hundred loops because you're just already that much closer yeah. um, to where you need to end up. So folding Jordan's advice into the code, it was time to let the model train. I left the code running overnight with 150 models in each generation. We got through over 50 generations, each one bringing iterative improvements, the computer getting better and better at beating itself at Kill Team. The question is, is it good enough to beat a professional nerd? Let's find out. This is the battlefield we're going to be duking it out over. So this is a normal kill team board, and what I've done is put a, a piece of plastic over the top with a grid and some coordinates along both axes. And this basically allows me to take what's in the computer's virtual battlefield and project it onto a real battlefield. So we both have the same information, me and the computer. Apologies that this camera angle is a little bit cockeyed, the kits are getting on a bit and limitations of space, sorry. The computer, of course, has its own virtual battlefield. I coded up a basic graphic user interface so that it will show that same grid where the models are and it allows me to interact with it so I can select a model and tell it to move or to charge or whether I'm done with that model. Now, you may notice that I have no dice here and that's because all the random number generation is gonna be taking place in the computer. Now, Wargaming fans may say, well, that doesn't really work because when your enemy shoots at you, they roll their dice to hit and wound and then you roll your dice to save. And yeah, I hear you, but A, that would be a pain in the ass to code, and B, whether they roll an imaginary dice in a random number generator or I roll a physical dice, doesn't actually make any difference because we're not having any command point rerolls. it's literally just random number generation. So all I have to do, the only agency I have in this game is exactly what the computer has, choosing where to move, where to charge, and who to shoot. Everything else is just coded into the algorithm and up to the luck of the random number generator. Now, this battlefield would be pretty boring to fight over because it's just a flat plane. So what I'm gonna do is add some terrain and then input that into the computer so that we both have the same information about where line of sight is, uh, where cover is, all that kind of stuff. And then we can see if the student has become the master. I really hope not, please don't turn out to be Skynet. Okay, apologies if the audio sounds a bit different. I had a minor crisis with the program, it broke. I then stepped on my microphone. So we're working with a backup. One change of coordinates later, we have our final battlefield. And now I need to put the miniatures where the computer has deployed them, which is random within the deployment zones. Marius, you're the plasma gunner. You are at E3. Always wanted to go there. 
S7, and then that leaves Agnathio. This was the first Space Marine I ever painted, so he's got a special place in my heart. Please don't die. Uh, he's a F3. Okay, and the Orcs, uh, starting with Chris Trot, the knob, <laughs> L23, V24, J27. Okay, sick, we're deployed. This is how things went down. In the first turn, the Orcs surged up the board, going mid. Shagrat fired a rocket and flesh-wounded Nevaeh, my heavy weapons marine, and in response, we had a dismal shooting phase, only taking out one Orc. In turn two, the Orcs continued to pound up the board, and Koros, my sergeant, countercharged to get the initiative in the fight phase. We chipped a wound off their boss knob, Chris Trot, but otherwise achieved nothing in the shooting phase, and nothing in the fight phase, as the dice absolutely refused to go my way. Then, in the third turn, everything went wrong. I attempted to preempt the charge from Chris Trot, and believed the model would split the rest of its forces and go for my marines on the left side, right side, and centre, but instead just dogpiled my sergeant in the centre. This left much of my firepower ineffective. My marines were out of position, most orcs were locked in combat and so unable to be shot, but Nevea was able to snipe Shagrat, exacting revenge for his rocket attack earlier. Unfortunately, Nevea then bought the farm due to some wild slugger fire from orcs who hadn't actually charged but were just in the centre. Just orc sniper things. My brave charging marine Torvar then got his face caved in by Chris Trot, though miraculously my sergeant survived. He was still pauldron deep in orcs though. In turn 4, I had the opportunity to blast away with my firepower which I completely squandered with yet more abysmal dice rolls. Not a single orc dropped due to our extensive firepower. Koros was able to take out Ross Hornby in the fight phase though, and somehow weathered the storm of attacks in return. By turn 5, things were looking grim. Koros disengaged and signalled his battle brothers to open fire on the pile of orcs in the centre. Unfortunately, they had all loaded foam bullets instead of 75 calibre shells, and not a single orc was killed yet again. The dice gods were not with me. They were with the orcs though, who just casually dropped Gunnar over on the left flank. <coughs> turn 6. Crunch time. For some reason, the model chose to largely stand still and shoot, perhaps confused by the distribution of targets, which left me a window of opportunity. If I just took out three t-shirt clad orcs, I would draw on points. The blood was pounding in my veins. This was it. Time for the wrath of the Adeptus Astartes to be visited upon these orcs. Just kidding, we couldn't hit anything. Not a single orc went down. And with that, that's it. It's over. I lost. I lost to my own computer program. What is this? The circle is now complete. When I left you, I was but the learner. Now I am the master. I am truly sorry, humanity, but I think I may have doomed us all. This isn't exactly how I wanted this to go, for a number of reasons. The battle reports I watch on YouTube are very long, which is very different from the content I make on this channel. If I uploaded a multi-hour battle report, it would completely screw my statistics and tank my channel's algorithmic ranking. Being so dependent on the YouTube algorithm is a major job insecurity for YouTubers like me. Fortunately, I was able to upload a greatly extended version of this video, including more discussion with Jordan and a comprehensive battle report over on Nebula. A coalition of YouTubers, including Tierzu, Jordan, Real Engineering and Lady Knight the Brave, and me, created Nebula as a place where we can upload the content we want to make, not the content the YouTube algorithm says we should make. We're free to experiment, create new formats, and collaborate with each other in mega series like working titles, breaking down the title sequences of our favourite shows. We also upload the content that we upload to YouTube early to Nebula, so you get early access on the site. But that's not the best bit. There are absolutely no adverts on the site. No auto-playing ads, no ad reads at the end of videos. The site runs on a subscription fee that is divided up among creators according to how much watch time their content received. It's fairer for us and a better viewing experience for you. We've partnered up with CuriosityStream, the number one provider of high quality documentaries on the internet, from How to Build a Castle to Amazing Gravity with Jim Al Khalili, with a special deal. For a limited time, you can get access to CuriosityStream's immense library and Nebula for not 40, but 41% off. That's less than $12 a year to not see adverts on your favorite YouTube content, to support your favorite creators, and to get the best library of long-form documentaries on the web. 
go to curiositystream.com forward slash Simon Clark and sign up. Doing so, you support your own learning and the community of online educators. That's curiositystream.com forward slash Simon Clark. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed making it. This project was very much the center of the Venn diagram of my nerdy interests from programming to Warhammer to YouTube. Here's some suggested viewing for the next half hour of your life. And if you enjoyed this video, please do pop it a like, leave a comment, and you can always subscribe if you want to see more stuff like this. I think that just leaves me to say um, thank you again for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Happy Festag!